Welcome at the International Conference Fathers and Employers in Action. Prav lepo vas pozdravljam v imenu partnerskega konzorcija, ki je izvajalo projekt očetje in delodajalci v akciji, torej vodilne organizacije Mirovnega inštituta ter partnerskih organizacij Fakultete za družbene vede Univerze v Ljubljani, potem Zveze svobodnih sindikatov Slovenije, podjetja Niša DOO, ter pa naših norveških partnerjev organizacije Reform iz Osla, Reform Resource Center for Men. Posebej se zahvaljujem na tem mestu norveškemu finančnemu mehanizmu, ki je projekt finančno podprlo. Naš projekt je izhajal iz ugotovitve, da je danes zaposlitev ključni dejavnik, ki vpliva na vključevanje očetov v družinsko delo in pa na njihove zmožnosti usklajevanja dela in družine. Zato se bomo danes na predavanju in pa v kroglih mizah spraševali o razmerih med zaposlitvijo in pa očetovstvom, kako se to tiče delodajalcev in pa kako politik. Vabim vas, da si na tančnejši program pogledate v mapah, ki ste jih dobili ob prijavi. Sedaj pa najprej vabim k besedi gospoda Dušana Semoliča, ki je predsednik Zveze svobodnih sindikatov Slovenije. Lepo pozdravljeni vsi, ki nas je združila ta tema na tem srečanju. Seveda še zlasti pozdravljam goste, ki pridajo od odrovod k nam. Smo deležni res neke posebne pozornosti in že vem zelo naprej, da tisto, kar bomo slišali, nam bo zagotovo koristilo. Ta tema ki nas danes druži, to sklevanje pač poklicnega dela, družinskega življenja, je zagotovo ena izmed velikih naših tem, ena izmed prioritetnih tem, ki pa seveda izziva vse nas, ker v mnogih stvarih nismo zadovoljni. Vsi slutimo, pravzaprav smo prepričani da bi lahko bilo še bolje pri nas. Je pa dejstvo, da živimo v nekem času, v nekih razmerah, ki prav naklonim tem temam ni, vsaj strani tistih, ki lahko tako usodno vplivajo na življenje vseh nas. Dejstvo je, da v tej Evropske uniji še vedno kljub krizi, kljub nekim morebitnim drugačnim spoznanjem, ki bi jih morala kriza ponujati, še vedno prihajajo pritiski po znižovanju delovskih pravic, socialnih pravic. To vse pliva na to temo, to ni opravičilo, ne, dalčo tega, ne, to je lahko izziv, ampak objektivno, ne, to vpliva na življenje tudi pri nas. To varčevanje za vsako ceno, ta ideal doseč nek proračunski primaklaj, da bi nekako potolažal te bogove iz Brisla in to si postavilo kot prioriteto, to vpliva na naše življenje. Na vse zadnje smo v Sloveniji še pred desetimi dnevi slišali recimo predlog, da bi za prve dni bolniške odsotnosti delovci ali pa delovke ne dobili nadomestila. Ta ukrep, če bi ga sprijeli, bi seveda v prvi vrsti prizadev mamice za otroke, kaj ti glede na razmere, kakorkol že je in nismo zadovoljni s temi razmerami, objektivno najpogoste tista dan, dva, tri, ko otrok ni za vrtec, ko otrok ni za všolo, ostane doma mamica in če so še ponovadi nizke plače, si lahko predstavljate, kaj bi pomenil tri, štiri dni bolniške, pa ne imeti povrneno nadomestilo. 
To je bil uraden predlog ministrstva za finance, tako da tukaj to ni nek predlog iz nekega drugega sveta. K sreči se ta stvar zaustavlja, ampak to vpliva na to temo, ki nas danes druži. To vpliva na to temo. Kajti, če bi bilo to spreto, bi spet to bi dodatno spodbuda, bi silil v nekem družinškem življenju, da bi mo šel delati naprej, kajti na domestilo moža, če je bil na bolniški, bi to prikrajšnje bi bilo večje, ker pravilo mažav imajo moški večje plače. Sveta, ta problematika je kompleksna in je prav, da vedno, ko se sprejemajo neke odločitve v te naši družbi, razmišljamo tudi o tej temi. Je pa res, da v Sloveniji vpliva na to izjemno velika intenzivnost dela. To, da moraš biti dobesedno 24 ur na razpolago delodajalcu. To, da se povečujejo ta prekerna, ta negotova oblika dela, zlasi za mlade. Tri četrt mladih dela je prisiljeno. Ta socialna negotovost vpliva na to temo. Vpliva na to temo. Sada, ka ustvarjati bi moral bolj prijazno življenje, bolj kvalitetno življenje do ljudi, do moških, do žensk, do otrok. Ampak danes se dotikamo prav te teme, moški, očetje, pač otroci. Mimo grede iz tega gradiva, imel sem pač privilegi, da sem že včeri malo priletel, napotuje moške še ne nekaj, prvi vrstin otroke, gotovo, ne, Ampak ta družba postaja vse starejša. Starejši ljudje imamo še starejše starše v domovih. To je demenca. In ne samo ženske. Moški tudi so dožni pomagati starejšim, torej svojim staršem, ko so stari 80 let, 90 let. Ampak danes, kot rečeno, nas druži ta povezava z otroki. Tukaj se pojavljajo pač, grobo bom rekel, štirje interesi. Najprej interesi otrok. Ni potrebno med vami govoriti, kako je pomembno za čustven razvoj, duševni razvoj otroka, da poleg mamice, tam, kjer je pač možno, žal nevedno, lahko tudi očetje prispevajo svoj delež. Zlasti takrat, bori si, ko nastane bolezen, pri vzgoji kar tako, pri počitnicah in še kdaj in kje. Zelo pomembno je, da delodajalci zaznajo, da je to nekaj velikega zapodjetje, da to ni breme za podjetje, da to ni nek strošek v tisti primerih, ko bi vendale dajali spodbude, da tudi očetje ostajajo doma in pomagajo pri vzgoji otrok. Svetka izziv je tako za delodejavce in tukaj je nekaj dobri praks, tudi pri delodejavcih in pri sindikatih. In da zaključem, ne, Tisto, kjer jaz vidim pomemben izziv, ki lahko vsi storimo več, je področje socialnega dialoga. O teh stvarih se moramo pogovarjati. O teh stvarih moramo iskati pač rešitve. In sindikati in delodejavci imamo tukaj možnosti. Moramo se teh možnosti zavedati. Mi imamo v Sloveniji pač socialni delog, vsej to so spolni paci, nočem idealizirati. Ampak vendale, ne, sindikati in delodajalci lahko v nekaterih trenutkih, žal so ti trenutki za nekoga priredki, vendale plivamo na zakonodajo. Vendale lahko plivamo na zakonodajo, ki je pomembno urodje za to temo, ki je predmet te konference. In potem seveda veliko področje kolektivnih pogodb. Kolektivne pogodbe so v Sloveniji zelo razširen inštrument. Če to primerjam s nekaterimi drugimi nam bližnjimi državami, zlasti v tem osrednjem delu Evrope. Pokritost s kolektivnimi pogodbami je velika, ni absolutna. 
to je pomemben inštrument, da vsi skupaj, skupaj za stroko tudi, ne, ker to je, mislim, da je izziv sveda s socialnem partnerem, ampak mi se moramo nasloniti tudi na stroko, na civilno družbo, na mnoge izmed vas, ki ste tukaj, ne, da lahko storimo mnogo več, kot smo storili to sedaj. Ampak tukaj obstanem. Jaz vam želim, da bi bila ta konferenca uspešna, da bi nam dala spodbudo, ideje, ne, zato, da bi bili tukaj boljši, kot smo danes. Hvala lepa. Najlepše hvala, gospod Semulič. Sedaj pa vabim, da nas pozdravi tudi gospod Tore Eugen Kvalheim, ki prihaja iz Druženja delodajalcev Spekter v Oslu. Prosim. Hvala vam so moč. Dear uh, conference, uh, thank you for inviting me on, uh, to your conference on fathers and employers in action. Uh, this is a matter that is of uh, utmost uh, interest for the uh, employer organization I represent. Uh, and may I also say it is of great interest to me as a uh, father. Uh, Work-life balance is not a women's matter, it is a matter for fathers as well as it should be for governments and business. Of course, on uh, gender and equality issues, also Norway still have challenges, but I think it is fair to say that it has been a growing awareness since the 1970s, both from governments, from employer and employee organizations, from trade unions, and in public that we have to create a culture where both women and men participate on, pa pa participate on equal terms, both at home and at work. And that raises two questions, why and how. So first, why? Well, for governments, governments are concerned on economic growth, both at macro and micro level. More women at work the higher workforce, that means higher productivity and, and increased GDP. Five years ago, Ministry of Finance found that the valued contribution of additional working mothers to our gross domestic product was equivalent to the value of, the, of, to the value of our pension fund since the oil was discovered in Norway in the late 1960s. So it should be fair to say that women are as much to thank as the oil for the wealth we have created for the last 40 years. Today, most women are working full time. Another aspect is aging, as also you mentioned. Aging and birth rates should concern all governments, not so much as we live longer, but that less babies are born. Governments all over Europe has to cope with this fact and have to find measures to stimulate families to have more children. Fewer kids today means, means a reduced workforce in the future. And also education. Education is free in Norway and the government spends billions on it. Today more women than men invest in higher education. The number is 55 to 45 percent. What a waste it should be if we educate women, but they choose to stay home. And that leads me to business and employers. We want to attract the best out there. If we only look for men, we may not find the right person with regard to competence and skills. And the smart girls may not be willing to work for you if you don't take gender equality serious. And mothers and fathers, well, most modern moms want to work as well. They want to use their skills to contribute to society. Besides, as expensive it is in Norway, families in Norway in general need a two-income household. And for us fathers, if not the opposite way, it is a fact that modern dads will not leave the home arena to the moms. We want to share our time with the babies and kids as well. And modern women, Women expect that from us, as do the children as they grow older. So the next question is how. 
how do we create this equal grand gender society and where we, where we men can feel we can contribute both at work and at home without compromise to one arena to the other? Well, legislation has to be in place, and equal, the Gender Equality Act has been there in Norway since the 70s. So has political will to invest or grant social benefits such as paid maternity leave, but ordinary child benefits were in place long before that. Later, we have got guaranteed rights to, child, to childcare, cash payment for home basis care, shared access to parental leave, and not to forget paternity leave. Paid paternity leave, daddy leave, father's quota, or papa perm, as we call it, was introduced by Gro Harlem Brundtland's government in 1993. It was then four weeks long and has since been extended several times up to 14 weeks in 2013, though the sitting government has since reduced it to 10 weeks. Since the beginning, the quota has been a big success and I believe it's about 80, 75 to 80% of the men take advantage of the leave today. And this, and the leave cannot be transferred to the, to the mother. So we believe that the equality in work life starts at home, in the family. Therefore, we need instruments that encourage equality and paternity leave is such a matter. It has created a culture for fathers to be more active parents than just secondary caregivers. Fathers need to go back from home Fathers need to go back from work to take part in the family life more than earlier. It's okay not to work long hours all week. You don't have to negotiate with your employer to get the, to leave. To get the leave, it is a, it is the normal thing to do. If the weeks was not fixed, we believe fewer men would take the would use this opportunity. Still, mothers do more than dad at home, but due to the paternity leave, this gap is closing ra more rapidly, we think. And it allows mothers to get sooner back to work and their career don't suffer. And that's also economic smart. And it allows mothers to work full time instead of part time. And not the least, it allows us men to connect closer bonds to our children on an early age. The father role is changing, and fathers today spend much more time with their kids on early age than our fathers did. Most men want to be in a working culture where, is it, where, is, where it's okay to take the leave. So, as I briefly noted earlier, we have challenges also, but I'd rather talk about them later, not to shadow the one important point you have to remember from my introduction, and that is paternity leave works. Thank you. Najlepše hvala gospod Kvalheim za te opogomljujoče besede. Naša naslednja govorka pa je dr. Živa Humer, vodja projekta Očetje in delodajalci v akciji, ki bo predstavila nekaj ključnih izsledkov našega projekta. Hvala. Danes lahko ugotavljamo tako v praksi, kot tudi študije domače in tuje. Potrjujejo, da si očetje, predvsem, če govorimo seveda o skrbi za otroke, da zasti očetje si želijo in si tudi prizadevajo za večjo vključenost v družinska življenja v skrb za otroke. Hkrati pa se je tudi izkazalo, potrdilo v raziskavi naši, da seveda ni vse odvisno le od posameznikovih želja in posameznikovih prizadevan, tem več, da je področje, kot smo tudi že v uvodnih govorih mojih predhodnikov lahko slišali, da je področje osklevanja zelo močno odvisno od posameznikovega trenutnega zaposlitvenega položaja ter tudi od delovnega mesta. To smo ugotavljali pri dveh skupinah očetov, ki sta sodelovali v raziskavi, ki smo jo upravili v spomladanskih mesecih lanskega leta, torej leta 2015, in sicer 
z očeti v prekarnih oblikah zaposlitev in z očeti na vodstvenih in vodilnih položajih. Ugotovili smo, oziroma se je izkazalo, da pri očetih, ki delajo v prekarnih oblikah zaposlitev in zdaj prekarne oblike zaposlitve smo mi vzeli, razumeli, zelo široko, torej tako samo zaposleni, ki delavci, ki upravljajo delo prek študentskega servisa, prek podjemnih avtorskih pogod, zaposleni za določen čas. Skratka, za vse te prekarne oblike so značilni atipični delavniki, velika negotovost dela in pa, kot je bilo že izpostavljeno tudi prej, neumejena razpoložljivost delavca, delodejalcu oziroma naročniku. In to so pravzaprav zelo konkretni problemi, so tudi odsotnost določenih pravic, recimo do različnih oblik dopustov, regresa, odsotnost plačanega dopusta, pogosto pa tudi neinformiranost o zakonskih možnostih. Zelo pogosto so očetje poročali o tem, da pravzaprav v primerjih, ko imajo zakonske možnosti usklejevanja, da pravzaprav teh ukrepov, teh mehanizmov niti ne koristijo v tolikšni meri, kot bi jih lahko, predvsem zaradi bojazni, da bi to negativno vplivalo na odnose v kolektivu, na odnose z delodejalcem in ne na zadnje, da je ena velika bojazen, da bi to lahko ogrozilo njihov prihodni zaposlitveni položaj. Skratka, sama disciplina je precejšna in precejšna strah, da bi ti ukrepi lahko negativno pravzaprav vplivali na njihov zaposlitveni položaj. Kot nam študije potrjujejo, pravzaprav uvajanje ukrepov, usklevanja plačanega dela in družine zasebnega življenja v organizacijah je lahko uspešno, učinkovito takrat, ko postane del organizacijskega sistema. To pomeni, da pravzaprav za vsi ti ukrepi usklevanja pravzaprav dobro skomunicirani v organizaciji, da obstaja vsega, dobra povezanost oziroma informiranost, obveščenost zaposlenih o možnostih, ki jih imajo, ker namreč tudi to se je v raziskavi izkazali in tudi tekom celotnega v bistvu projekta, da pravzaprav zaposleni niti ne vedo vedno o vseh možnostih, ki jih obstajajo. In seveda tudi vodstvo pri tem ima pomembno vlogo, se je lahko s svojim zgledom, torej da koristijo ukrepe tudi v praksi, lahko seveda dajo zgled zaposlenim, da je torej usklejevanje dela in družine del organizacije in pomemben del, ne pa kot zgolj nek dekorativni dodatek. Hkrati pa smo v projektu želeli oziroma izpostavljamo, da je usklejevanje plačanega dela in družine zasebnega življenja skrbi za otroke več smeren proces, ki vključuje raznolike deležnike. Torej, tako delodajalce, tako sindikate, zaposlene, kadrovske službe, pravne službe in si nekako prizadevamo, kar je pravzaprav tudi zaživelo v praksi tekom vsega, projekta z vključevanjem očetom prijaznih ukrepov sklejevanja, plačanega dela in skrbi za otroke v štirih različnih organizacijah in o tem pravzaprav več v nadaljevanju. Skratka, več smeren proces, ki vključuje raznolike deležnike, ki aktivno in enakopravno sodelujejo v procesu oblikovanja ukrepov in potem tudi uvajanja in izvajanja v organizacijah. Kot sem rekla, vloga vodstva je pri tem zelo pomembna, zaradi tega, ker vodstvo ima seveda možnost ustvarjanja in odločanja o strategijah usklejevanja, vendar pa se pokaže, in to se je pokazali tudi v raziskavi, da so očetje na vodstvenih vodilnih položajih, pravzaprav ukrepe usklejevanja, koristijo manj v primerjavi z drugimi skupinami zaposlenih očetov zaradi organizacijske kulture, ki temeli na normah nenadomestljivosti in nenehne razpoložljivosti organizacij in pa spolnih vlog, po katerih moškost konstituira dajanje prioritete profesionalni karjeri pred družino. 
Pogost je vzorec, ki se je potrdil tudi v Sloveniji, mislim tudi v okviru reziskave, je vzorec nenadomestljivega delavca v organizaciji in nadomestljivega starša pri skrbi za otroke. Pokazalo se je tudi to, da ta popolna vključenost in predanost sferi plačnega dela, seveda z nenihno razpoložljivostjo, vpliva na omejeno prevzemanje skrbstvenih obveznosti moških na vodstvenih poljžajih v njihovih družinskih življenjih, kar se odraža zelo pogosto v vikend očetovstvu. Vendar pa je opaziti premik zlasti pri mlajši generaciji moških, rojenih tam od 70. let, 20. stoletja dalje, kaže, da so pravzaprav premiki, ki gredo v smeri enakomerne delitve plačnega dela in obveznosti v odgovornosti pri skrbi za otroke med partnerjema. Te prakse očetovanja skratka zajemajo večjo opetost pri skrbi za otroke in prezimanje obveznosti v družinskem življenju tudi na račun sprememb v delovnih okoljih kot sta omejitev delovnika in pa zmanjšanje ali zmanjšanje količine dela. Zdaj pri tem je seveda potrebno povedati, da je ta skupina očetov v veliki manjšini bila prisotna v naši raziskavi, ampak je pa pomembno, da ta manjšina je, ker or je ledino, tako pri razbijanju spolnih stereotipov in tradicionalnih spolnih vlog, kot pri seveda sprememba, vnašanju sprememb v delovna okolja. In zdaj, če počasi zaključim te svoje vodne besede, seveda so pomembna individualna prizadevanja očetov na vodstvenih, na vodilnih položajih, ki gre do v smeri skrbstvenega očetovstva, vendar pa ob individualnih prizadevanjih so potrebne seveda tudi sistemske spremembe, sistemske spodbude, tako na ravni države, kot v organizacijah, ki temeljijo na prepoznanju, da sta v bistvu skrbstveno delo in pa plačano delo povezana dela v življenih ženskih in moških. In ne, da se to ločeni, popolnoma ločena področja, kot se pogosto dojema danes. Skratka, če se za zaključni stavek navežem na organizacijo, iz katere prihajam, torej Mirovnega inštituta, lahko rečem, da ne bomo dali miru in da bomo si še naprej prizadevali in delovali v smeri zagotavljanja večje enakosti spolov, Ne glede na to, da je področje enakosti spolov, področje vsklevanja, so to teme, za katere pravzaprav nikoli ni dovolj časa, nikoli ni dovolj denarja, vedno so druge veliko pomembnejše teme, s katerimi se je treba ukvarjati hkrati, pravzaprav so pa to temeljne stvari, s katerimi se moramo ukvarjati in se bomo tudi v prihodnje. Hvala lepa. Najlepše hvala Živa. Torej, zdaj smo zaključili s tem uvodnim delom, s pozdravnimi nagovori. Sledi pa predavanje profesorja Viktorja Zajdlerja, zelo znanega raziskovalca in pa misleca na tem področju. Tako, da ga jaz kar vabim, da nam predstavi, kar je pripravil. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor. And coming from a country that at the moment is reconsidering its position in terms of the EU, this is an important place to be because it's important for England to stay and the UK to stay in the context of the EU. And it's exactly as people have already said, the social rights that are guaranteed and the work rights that are guaranteed through the EU are, will be threatened if the UK leaves. Issues around masculinity and issues around work-life balance are not secondary. They are absolutely vital and core issues. Now, I've written a paper and it's in your pack. So you can read it when you get home quietly um, in your own way. But what I want to do is introduce some important background questions so that we can think together about how important these issues are. First, I want to thank the organizers and the partners, Norwegian partners, for the ODA project. 
this is, under Jiva's work and the team that she's working with, a really important European project. And the Norwegians are to be congratulated in supporting it. There's something about the quality of the interview work, and it's already been shown in what Jiva said, that means that this is a project that the rest of Europe will in fact look to and learn from. The world is changing. We live in uneasy and dangerous times. Since the 2008 financial crisis, the crisis around refugees, Europe is in a threatened and difficult situation and has been. But it does not make these questions around gender superficial. It makes these questions about the quality of life even more central. Slovenia is a country that knows the world can change. Some people in this room were born into a country that no longer exists, into a language that no longer exists. So the older people, and I count myself as an older person, know that history matters and the world can change. And the world has changed because also technologies have transformed our everyday lives. Our everyday lives at work and also our everyday lives at home. The older people here know that work used to be defined as nine to five. And there was a clear division between work life and family life. And in Slovenia, there is a history of widespread equal women's employment and a vision of gender equality that meant that women worked, but often women had to have double jobs because women were held to then be responsible for childcare and domestic work almost exclusively. And masculinity, and we know it, was defined in terms of being a breadwinner, a provider. We know this from our families, from how we grew up. And fathers were seen as authorities within the family who were providers, but who were not to be involved with children, except for the phrase, I don't know what it is in Slovenian, and I'm sorry not to be talking in Slovenian, wait till your daddy comes home. Do you remember that phrase? It echoes. The father comes back into the family as a figure of authority. Those days have changed. But I also want to focus on what it meant for fathers. Because often men, as men, learn to compartmentalize our lives. Women often can work across boundaries. Men often compartmentalize and split off. But it can't happen anymore because the 24-7 has transformed the relationship between work and not work. Most people here have got a telephone in their pocket. That phone means that people can be expected to be accountable 24-7 in the sense that the technology has broken the distinction between work and family. And traditional trade union conceptions have had to change, and it's very welcome to hear it, have had to change to meet a new reality. 
And that reality meant that traditionally fathers were told, it doesn't matter if I'm absent from my children's lives now, because later, when I retire or something, I can pick up those relationships. That was the story that fathers were told in an earlier generation. And it's created disappointment and sadness. Because that generation of men have had to realize that even when they had the time, the distance between their sons and their daughters had grown so much that it could not be unmade. And often fathers, older fathers who retired, become depressed because they feel the distance from their families and they recognize that they were sold a myth, both in capitalist but also in socialist worlds, because they didn't give the chance to recognize how important it is, and I know this from my own life, to be involved with my children from the moment of pregnancy right the way through birth and early childhood. And it's been the presence of young men with their partners at birth that has often transformed men's relationships to their partners and made them aware that they want to be involved in a different way. This happened in the UK in the 1980s, but the idea of men being present at birth has taken time, but now it's probably seen as almost not only desirable, but almost normal to think that it's a possibility. And that's part of transforming how men, as fathers, seek a new social contract, a new dialogue, a social dialogue, which reframes relationships between work and family life that means that men will have to be more involved with domestic everyday positions of care, but that at a fundamental level, we need to rethink the notion of provider, breadwinner masculinity. We need to think about caring masculinities. We need to think about how men can be involved with their children, not just as weekend fathers, and not simply as we've had also in Scandinavia, the notion of quality time, because children want quality, but they also want quantity. They want that time with their parents to be recognized and real and they don't want to, as is happening, be bribed or manipulated or bought off with the idea that, I'm sorry, both parents are working, but we both need to work in order to provide you with the latest PlayStation or video game. So we need to rethink gender equality because we've also learned that if fathers and mothers come home, but they're both exhausted, both of them don't want to really spend much time with children, so that the children often lose out in relationship to it. So it's important to rethink family relations and to recognize how important it is for fathers and mothers, adults, to develop certain skills in their relationships in order to be able to deal with issues. Now, work has changed. 
But managers at work, if they come in, say you're a manager. We can imagine that, can't we, for a moment. And we think that our relationship is about to break up. And we're upset because we know we're heading for a divorce or a separation. Or say that a parent has died. And we come into work, but often men, because we're so used to compartmentalizing, will not look to support. They'll not come in and talk to even their close mates at work and say, things are really heavy at home. I think we're going to get divorced. Or, I feel vulnerable. My father's got dementia, as mentioned, and I don't know what to do. I don't know what my responsibilities are. I don't know how or what work-life balance means. Because men have often been brought up to feel that needing support or acknowledging emotions is a sign of weakness. And it's experienced as a threat to their masculinity to their male identities. So it's been said that even if the policies exist, men often won't take advantage of them because they feel that their status, the notion that uh, Jiva mentioned of being irreplaceable. As men, we love the idea that we're irreplaceable. We love it. And it's difficult to then recognize that we're irreplaceable, not simply at work, but also we have to rethink our relationships between work and home and a different social contract which will allow men to feel that they're growing and developing both at work and at home. Now, if a guy comes into work and his father has just got dementia, the chances are that he's going to be frustrated and angry and he's going to let that frustration out on his workers or people in his team. But they won't be able to say, look, wait a minute. What's going on for you? Because he would have been closed down emotionally and will be unresponsive. So he has the power to take out his frustrations on the people who are working for him. And he can't answer back. How did I learn this? I learned this through a French Catholic thinker, Jewish background, called Simone Weil. And there were two observations she made. And she was working on the assembly line in Renault's in Paris in 1934. And she recognized that anger, the frustration on the line, couldn't be expressed because you would lose your job. So that frustration is often taken home. It's taken home and taken out on partners and children. And often you hear young men say, I was very nervous when I came home and I used to step on eggshells. I don't know what it means in Slovenian, eggshells, because of the tension in the family. So if it's possible for those people in power, often men in managerial situations, to pass on their feelings and frustrations, 
it's important for men in general to learn to take emotional responsibility so that they can deal with their issues. Now my suggestion, and this just came to me recently working for this, is that fathering, the capacity to father, helps produce certain skills and capacities. Now Simone Vale said, look at a family and look at the health of the youngest child. And the health of the family can be indicated by the youngest child. Because in the 24-7 technological world we live in, people have to be constantly available. So that it's very difficult to work out tensions and frustrations happening in relationships, which is why there's such high, and I don't know what it is in Slovenia, divorce and separation rates. And the highest rate is often 16 months after the birth of the first child. Because at that moment, stresses come to the surface and relationships break up. So it might be that the skills learnt through fathering are crucial resources at work. That as a good enough father, you have to learn to exercise authority, but with compassion in a different way. You want to have a relationship with your child in a way that your father did not have with you. And this is widespread since the 1970s. Fathers want to be more involved with their children, we all did, than our fathers were with us. But often we need support in order to learn how to father well. What if I'm in the police service in Slovenia and my, I, and my relationship is in difficulty? How do I learn to negotiate? Who do I get support from in order to develop my relationship? in a healthy way. In a period of austerity post-2008 and with the increase of precarious employment, it becomes more important. These questions become more important because in the UK but also in Europe, we're finding an increase in issues around mental health, depression, and the incapacity to operate at work because people feel challenged by their partners to relate in a different way. And that depression is often being held in, not even shared within the context of intimate relationships. So a younger generation want a different contract and they want their lives in the context of being fathers to be acknowledged, not simply at the level of policy, but at the level of what we call culture, canteen culture. In Britain we found, in the police force, working in the police force, high levels of misogyny and racism that were not part of the policies of the organization, but were part of the culture that made it very difficult for men to stand out or be different. Changes are happening, and it's important to find a way of young men gaining support from each other in order to feel their own value, both as fathers and also as workers. With the increase of precarious employment 
and in the increase of contracts, which in Britain have spread enormously, called zero-hours contracts, where people have no security, it becomes more important to open up conversations within the context of the family and for men not to feel that they have to deal with everything on their own. So when men are being made unemployed, and it can happen at a managerial level, and it can happen at a precarious employment level, sometimes they're not even going home because they're scared of telling their partner what's happened and they feel that they let their families down. And in that case, we've had high levels of young male suicide as crucial issues in the UK, but also across Europe, where young men have often felt it is easier for me, and this is so harrowing, it's easier for me to take my own life than it is to show my vulnerability or my depression to people that I'm close to. And when these cases of suicide happen, what's most striking is how people in the family and close friends had no idea of what was happening to these young men. They were so locked into themselves that it became difficult to gain support. So the idea in Slovenia of setting up possibilities, not only in, in all these different areas, for young men to feel it's not a sign of weakness, but a sign of strength to show my vulnerability, to be able to actually feel valued in who I am as a man, and to learn, to learn, what it is to balance and feel gender equality in the relationship that I have. With aging parents and with Europe aging, these issues have become much more central with men also, and it was said really well, having to take responsibility for our older fathers having dementia or conditions of care. So we need to think about the notion of a caring masculinity in which men feel able to feel supported in their relationships and also able to feel that they are able to make certain demands at work or deal with the issues that they are, in fact, confronting. So learning from the project, and I'm just going to finish here, I'm being clear on time. Learning from the project, so this is Europe learning from Slovenia. But it makes a difference. We can have policies and fine words, but we also need to know what's happening on the ground. So Marko Gucek, I'm probably saying the word completely wrong, who is the chief executive of um, TM Vista. So this is learning from showing you the value of this project. Talking about his trucking firm. The fundamental value of the company co-op is kindness towards passengers, employees, drivers, fellow human beings. We're aware that a good driver is not only physically and psychologically in good control of the van, but is also a satisfied employee. Consequently, he's then able to be kind to others, to himself, the family, 
other people. We're aware that the profession of driver can also be challenging also to the families of the drivers because working at night presents additional challenges to young daddies. This shows you the value of the project that we're here to celebrate. To create that kind of relationship so that people can share that kind of vision which is here in everyday life in Slovenia is one thing to put it into beautiful words and employers are good at that. It's another thing to make it a reality for the life of those drivers. So I just want us to think about those drivers, male drivers and also female drivers, and what it is that the idea of balance between work and life means, and how it, in difficult times of austerity, these questions are more, not less, important. These questions need to be addressed because they affect the life of each man, each woman, and each child in Slovenia. Thank you. So, I'm going to... I think there's time for a few questions. Mm -hmm. Sonia Schmutz from Managers Association. Uh, thank you for really a great uh, view on how um, things are changing with the generations and also uh, of how left out men were from, the, uh, from their family lives and how that um, imported them. Uh, in a way. Uh, but just a question back to, to employers. Uh, you shared one of good Slovenian um, cases. Uh, could you share maybe some of the UK's uh, best cases for how employers try to find a way of uh, reconciling of uh, family and work life? Well, in the UK, um, the, the question of paternity leave is still being fought over. There's still very limited paternity leave in the UK. And though there's been quite a strong movement of men, particularly in the 70s and 80s, which is where I came in, I came in through a movement which was called, we met as a men's group. I was first in a men's group in um, a long time ago, in the, in the early 80s, and we created a, a journal called Achilles' Heel. And the Achilles' Heel was the idea that, in the story, the, 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 the heel was the only point where a man could be vulnerable. But somehow it was in your vulnerability that you are going to be able to change. And I think in the UK, there have, been diff there have been measures in um, employment situations which have been fought over because we've had quite a strong neoliberal um, economy. So within the neoliberal economy, it's taken time for employers to recognize the importance of these kinds of issues. But the fact that so many young women, and it's been mentioned, go through higher education and are in more full-time employment has really changed the balance. It's really changed the balance in the UK. And what we've discovered is that in the 1990s, young women tended to think that gender equality was something to do with their mother's generation. It wasn't really to do with them. And it was only after 2008 that we're finding a new movement, quite strong movement, um, in order to make demands on employers um, 
and in order to try and create a different kind of culture in the context of kind of workplaces. But the fight around paternity leave has been important. It's nowhere near as developed as, it's, as it is in Scandinavia. Um, and then the, the notion of uh, fathers being able to leave if children are sick and whether in fact these are policies or in what way they're the, uh, a shift in culture. The major shift in culture has been through the number of women in full-time employment and managerial positions. And that's, I think, been the kind of critical shift in the way that policies have happened. Um, thank you very much for... Uh, thank you very much for, for your uh, lecture and also for this answer. What really uh, intrigues me in your um, lecture was the sentence you said, if UK uh, um, goes out of the Uni European Union, it will endanger uh, the balance and the human rights or issues connected with social equality in uh, Europe. Up till now, UK was not the, the champion of equality in Europe, the opposite. It really made difficult the solutions which were pro proposed by several states, how to, to do better balance between uh, work and, and um, private life. So this is my question. Why do you think that uh, you, uh, European Union without UK will be uh, a worse place to live for, for men and women? I think that's, that's a very important question because in... Um, for so many years, one of the big changes in the economic organization has been a kind of neoliberal economy. The neoliberal economy has produced a different kind of masculinity and a different kind of common sense. And that neoliberal uh, common sense creates a sense that men only have themselves to blame if they're not successful or they don't achieve. And that there's a fear of being a loser. And this is a kind of ideology that's moved across class in the UK. And it's meant a devaluation of working class experience and lives, a denigration of working class experience and lives. But in the last few years, particularly after 2008, there's been a fight back and a resistance and a real shift. So my sense of if the UK leaves, because the question's about Europe, is that it will allow certain kinds of populist and nationalist forces in Europe, that it will trigger other countries thinking about leaving, and that the social chapter the, which the UK has not been an active and positive uh, supporter of, will be weakened. So there will be a chain of reaction if the UK leaves. So it, it's in that regard that I think the, uh, we'll lose it. So. Um, tako, ja, ja, vam prinesem mikrofon. Ja, seveda. Uh, imamo še, pobrali bomo dve vprašanje. Potem pa moramo žal nadaljevati, ker imamo kar precej pavn uh, program, pa gospod uh, Zajdler bo imel tudi čas v odmoru, da bo lahko kaj rekel. Kar? Ja, hvala. Jaz sem Polonca Štajman, upokojena zdravnica v kliničnem centru. Um, uh, Čestitam k, vaši, k vašem predavanju. Jaz sem hotla vse to tudi komentirati, ker ste omenili. A, ampak... Um, Osnovne človeške vrline so vse za ston in sicer v zvezi z moškimi, o katerih danes govorimo. Problem depresivnih in suicidalnih moških je v zgodovinskih spominih na številne tisočletne vojne v tvojem genomu. In zaradi tega govorimo tudi o kriminalnem gemu, genu, o borbenem genu in je to velik problem, kako to izničiti oziroma omiliti. Pojdimo na ceste. V Sloveniji vidimo, da je šofer 
merilo našega moškega lahko. To je ena ideja. Kot splošni zdravnik bi rekla, da nekateri splošni zdravniki ne dajajo bolniškega staleža za očetovstvo. Recimo, to je tudi razumevanje velik problem. Govorim iz Slovenije. To, kar se mi danes tudi ljudje pritožujejo. Svetujem pa za vas moške tukaj, ki vas je veliko, pa ste gotovo vsi pridni na svojih delovnih mestih, da predno greste v partnerstvu, pojdite na katero koli področje na delavnice za pogovarjace učit. To je eno. Drugič, tisti, ki ste šefi, imejte delavnice, workshops za pogovarjati. Jaz sem pred leti vodila enkrat delavnico v enem malem podjetju z desetimi ljudmi, prisoten je bil direktor, poddirektor in delavci. In je tudi on, ta direktor, povedal svoje napake in tist, kar je bluzil in tako naprej. Potem pa še za pomoč za starejše. Delala sem z geriatrično populacijo, to se pravi s starejšimi, 50 do 100 let so bili stari, vedno je žena negovala moža. To je bil, zelo redko je moški negoval žensko. In tudi otroci, moški otroci niso imeli razumevanja v Sloveniji. Pogosto, rečmo, sigurno 3, 4 do 80 procentov za ostarele očete ali mame. To je praksa. Hvala. What is your experience in the combination between the notion of fatherhood and the notion of workspace? Are you satisfied as a father? You're never satisfied. As a father, you always feel that you could be doing more or doing differently. I was very lucky when I became a father because I was teaching in university and I had control over my time. So I could be involved with my children right the way through from the beginning. But it's only because I realized how important that relationship was that I think these issues are so important. Talking about the really important questions that you raised, I think the thing about communication is really vital and learning communication skills. And I think your experience of being together in a small firm is really important. And it might be that the question of fathering is so important because it's a way that a worker as a father has similar issues about sleepless night or whatever than a manager. So it's a way of creating a bridge within organizations, which in some way is humanizing. So there is, and I've just been thinking about this, a way that these issues almost become more important as a way of workers and managers, trade unionists, talking to each other because they are not simply talking about redistribution of work and pay, they're also talking about and beginning to recognize that each of them shares these issues and conflicts. So it could be a way of people recognizing certain interests across capital and labor in an important way. The other issue which you raise, which I also think is really important, is if sharing my vulnerability is a sign of weakness, so I can't do it, I turn to alcohol or I turn to drugs. So issues around alcohol and high alcohol consumption, and again, I don't know what the situation in Slovenia is, but if you think about alcohol and drugs, and you also think about the experience of war and division, and you think about the memory in families, across different generations and the difficulty of sons and fathers talking to each other, possibly because the father grew up in a very different world. 
So Slovenia, like in former Yugoslavia, has particular issues around breaks in historical memory. So when we think about masculinity, we have to think about memory and historical memory and how it's communicated or not communicated. And the way we've often learned about it is to be silent, is not to talk. So my family, I'm a second generation child of Jewish refugees. My parents didn't talk about what they had lived through because they wanted to protect me as a child. And we all want to protect our children. We want the best. But being silent and not communicating creates emotional and psychic difficulties. So the question of communication and the question of sharing memories becomes vital in the, exactly the kind of work. Because people don't share, relationships get tense and you have a high divorce and separation level. That affects employers right across the board. So again, these issues which look like to do with emotions and feelings, and therefore secondary, are in fact absolutely vital. Just think about your own relationship, in a gay or straight relationship. Just think about the quality of your communication with your partner. What can you talk about? What can't you talk about? What do you go silent about? What can you share? When you go silent, you create a distance. So when parents don't speak, as my parents didn't speak, that created distance. And I had to learn. And if I didn't learn, I could have turned to alcohol or to drugs. I would have numbed myself. So the way that men learn to numb themselves, not to feel, to lock things inside of themselves, or the disappointment at their father's depression because they cannot speak across that generation, or the father's dementia. So suddenly, as a son, you feel that you're in control or authority in relationship to your father. All these are difficult questions, and we need a social dialogue in order really to engage with them at different levels, so that they become part of a wage contract, a new social contract, that recognizes just how central these concerns are to living a life of value. Questions of value are important for each human being, and how we value and what we value has to be at the center of the dialogue both with ourselves and with others. Thank you again. Thank you.